sense of the word in terms of insurance companies and sovereign wealth funds and things like that. But it's the it's the level above your typical, you know, syndication investor who's putting in, you know, fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars at a time. So, you know, the first definition, let's define what I mean here. Institutional investors in our context are groups that are writing checks anywhere from, you know, as low as 1 million to really up to 15 to $20 million checks. And uh, this could be a high net worth individual, a family office, private equity fund, opportunity fund, and, you know, whatever else they want to call themselves. So, and what's interesting is there's a little bit of a myth and allure about, uh, about this type of investor and, you know, is, is it possible? Do they exist? How do you raise money for that with, with them? And uh, is it for me? And so, you know, this first slide, I just want to say you can do it. So if you're listening to this and, and you've, you know, raised only um, retail capital, as, as we call it, 50 to $100,000 at a time, and you just think, well, you know, the, the big checks are for the big boys. Um, I'm not there yet. You know, I encourage you to think again and look into this uh, as a thing that this is something that you, you could really be doing, um, you know, today. So along those lines, here are just some of the, the myths and things to, to get you thinking more in this way and get you excited about partnering with institutional capital. So number one, you don't have to be a fully established, super legit, operating business to qualify and attract larger institutional checks. So what I mean is you don't have to have a, you know, hundred person office with a full accounting team, fund administration, um, asset management team, acquisitions team, multiple offices. You, you don't, nor do you have to have a 10 year multi-cycle many exit track record. Um, as I'll talk in the next slide, really once you've done a couple of deals hopefully have had an exit either through a sale or refinance you really are able to have those conversations and you know partner with these with these companies another myth is um you don't have to so one of the ways that these institutional deals get structured is a 90 10 is what it's called so the joint venture capital provider is going to put up 90% of the equity and it'll be your responsibility to come up with the latter 10%. And on a larger size deal where it's a $10 million equity check, you know, you have to come up with a million dollars. And so some people think, well, that actually has to come out of my pocket because that's one of the big requirements. They want to see skin in the game. And if you don't have a million dollars, well, I guess you just can't do the deal. And that's just not true. So that's another myth. Um, you know, you still do have to come up with a million dollars, but that's where your skills and previous relationships in your um, retail syndication experience comes into play. Uh, and we can talk more about how to structure, you know, co-GPs or, you know, um, essentially fulfilling your GP equity requirement with uh, syndication equity. Another point here is just like syndication, no different, build relationships early and often you know, have these conversations, prime the pump, talk deals, and, um, you know, get, get on the path to, to, cl to closing your first deal with a, you know, a larger institutional partner. The last point here is the elusive minimum check size myth. So this is a, a really funny thing that you may experience or bump into as you're trying to navigate this, um, you know, larger check, more sophisticated investor world, which is, you know, your deal is just going to be the awkward size. So you're going to have a deal that needs $3 million of equity. And everybody you're going to talk to is going to say, oh, that's just too small for us. You know, we do only $5 million checks and up. Um, and then, and then you're going to have an $8 million equity deal, which is going to be, let's say a $30 million transaction. And you're going to be talking to people and they'll say, oh, you know, that's too small. We only write $10 million checks. And so you, you know, there's these myths in, and you never know what is fitting in somebody's box, um, whether it's too small, too big. And, but the reality is, so some people are led to believe, well, you know, everybody's minimum is 10 million plus or 15 million plus. 
but that's not true. Uh, there's, it, it is less common for sure, but there are plenty of groups out there that will write as small as a $1 million equity check um, in this more sophisticated space. However, it is easier and I highly encourage you to pursue the larger deals um, you know, for the, for the simple fact that there is far more benefit that is being brought to the table by a capital provider when they can write a $5 million plus check at once, because if it's just a million dollar equity requirement, you know, you might as well syndicate that because the terms are going to be more favorable and uh, you know, you'll likely have a better outcome. So now we'll talk about how to prepare. So as I mentioned before, maybe you, you know, recently closed your first syndication or maybe you've done a handful and you've had, you know, a couple exits. Now is the time to start. Now is the time to start building those relationships with these larger groups, family offices, private equity funds, um, co-GP partners, and um, more ways to really groom yourself and put yourself in the best position possible to attract this type of capital is number one, focus on one market. I cannot stress this enough because this is the first question that um, investors ask and it'll be sometimes just a non-starter and you want to be known as that local partner. The pitch is because these groups have their own investors. So if they're an opportunity fund with a hundred million dollars or $500 million, they have to answer to their investors and they have to make sense of what they're doing. And their pitch is we've got the capital, we have the market experience, but we're relying on a local partner with true boots on the ground and, and market experience to help us you know, find the best deals and, and navigate us through that. So if you can position yourself as that local sponsor, you'll have a much easier time uh, really passing that, that small initial hurdle. Um, because especially for a first time deal, meaning it'll be your first deal working with this capital provider, it's, it's very difficult to convince them to go to a new market with you because now they have to answer two very big questions. They're creating a lot of headline risk for themselves when they answer to their investors because they're asking, you're investing with a new partner in a market that's new to you and them or, or just new to them. Um, you just don't want to, to bring up those questions. So if you can, if this is the path you want to go down, I highly encourage you to go deep in one market now, become that local sponsor that they're seeking now, the next thing here is the pros and cons of, you know, the next question is what market to be in. Uh, should you pick a bigger market or a smaller market? And there's really uh, no right answer, but there are certainly pros and cons of both. So if you talk to, you know, larger investors, they typically will want the, the brand name markets, the growth markets, such as Phoenix, Denver, Dallas, Atlanta, South Florida. And those markets, as we all know, are extremely competitive, um, very hard to find good deals. You're competing with, uh, you know, larger, more experienced uh, operators, and it can, it can be much more difficult. So the question is, what part of your job do you want to be more difficult? Finding a good deal or finding investors? Because if you're in a smaller market, that you can, again, go deep as the local sponsor with the boots on the ground, you'll have an easier time gaining competitive advantage and finding better deals, but you'll have to overcome that smaller market hurdle and, and you know, less quality market hurdle uh, with your investors. So it's, it's really a choice. And um, you know, it may have to do with where you're at and the size of deals that you want to do, because there are absolutely, this might even done well on the previous slide in terms of myths, um, institutional investors are absolutely comfortable going to smaller markets, even tertiary markets. You just have to find the right investors that will partner with you on those types of deals, but you can absolutely make it happen. And, um, you know, it may be a great way to start out and gain momentum and then get onto the bigger markets, bigger deals and, and grow your portfolio. So the next way to prepare yourself to be most, um, you know, groomed to take on institutional partners is to be vertically integrated. 
Uh, what that means is starting your own property management company and uh, trying to bring in as much of the operation in house um, for, you know, for right or wrong, we can talk a little bit more about that. Investors see that your in-house operations, you, your vertically integrated company is bringing a lot more value to the table than if you're just the sponsor who's hiring out the third party manager and they're paying you to then pay the manager. They, they don't like that. And again, it's creating another headline risk or, you know, they have to answer to their investors and saying, well, you know, you're paying this person tons of money to just hire a third party management company to take care of the job. Obviously everybody who owns property here knows that that's not how it works. When, when you do hire a third party management company, there's a ton of work in, involved still managing the manager. Nonetheless, the majority of investors frown upon uh, third party management companies. And for some, it's even a, a non-starter. So a requirement to do business with them is to be vertically integrated. So uh, take that for what you will. I've also spoken recently to a, a fund that uh, doesn't like vertically integrated sponsors. And it was actually really interesting. I heard it on my podcast and n never thought about it this way, but he explained that when you have a vertically integrated sponsor and the third party management, you know, the sponsors management company is underperforming, you're going to have a, a, a much worse time firing that management company and bringing in a new manager because, you know, it's all intertwined. So he didn't like that because in the event of a, of a firing of the third party management company, it was just a, a more tenuous situation. So it was an interesting perspective that I hadn't thought of, but I highly recommend that you start thinking about how you could go about starting your own property management company. If you want to, you know, really move into this direction of, of joint ventures and co GPs and, and doing hopefully larger deals and larger equity checks uh, from more sophisticated investors. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a way for you to build a closer relationship with a third party management company and somehow integrate them into your organizational structure uh, by giving them some equity or um, aligning interests in other ways or, or sharing some payroll in terms of some key employees that, that both of you will share, um, you know, get creative so that you can really paint that picture to your investors in the best light that, that you're really being value added on the operation side. So the next piece is the track record. And again, I've already said this a couple of times, you don't have to have a long list of exits, uh, round trips um, with just a couple of deals in that one market. Uh, that'll be enough to really pass the test and, and to get them to take you seriously and have real conversations about, you know, doing your next deal with them. And the next few things are, uh, you know, smaller uh, items, but infrastructure. So professional appearance, office, organizational chart, uh, you know, they want to know that you're a real business, that this is your full-time thing. Uh, you know, you are here to stay. You have a, you have a team. This isn't just you working out of your, your house. So, you know, showing that you have an office or some, some sort of base of operations with, you know, hopefully an asset manager, an acquisitions person, you know, maybe an outsourced accounting firm, but just, you know, the more you can show that this is a real going concern, uh, we'll get them more comfortable and they'll have an easier time pitching you and the deal to their investment committee and, and their investors. Lastly is a small, small, but very important one in institutional reporting capabilities. So on the institutional side, reporting is everything. Uh, again, I keep going back to this headline risk thing or you know, invest, um, you know, funds having to answer to their investors and reporting is a, is a huge piece. Um, you know, again, they're the capital partner. They're the passive uh, side of the deal, but they're still, they want to, you know, feel that they're a part of the deal and that they're staying on top of it. And one of the, you know, really the only way to do that is through reporting, ongoing communication, reporting. So you need to have really quality reporting capabilities. Um, and that's, that's a big thing for investors and a, a big risk when they're working with a smaller company. So when they see that you're a small firm with only a couple deals in your portfolio, you know, I think what gets them concerned is less so that 
you know, you're inexperienced and you don't know what you're doing They're They're worried that you just don't have the capability to, you know, manage things at a professional level and really report everything and keep them involved on, on a true asset management level. So, you know, this can easily be solved by hiring a professional uh, accounting company and, um, you know, because it is very difficult to build your own internal accounting team uh, without scale. So let's talk about criteria. And I just want to check here. It doesn't seem that we have any questions, but please let me know if uh, anybody has any questions. So on criteria, we're talking about what deals are they looking for? What are their return requirements? And, um, you know, what other, what other sticking points do they have? So number one, I put this big bullet, investors are sensitive to vintage. So this is an interesting idea that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, and when I say vintage, I mean uh, the age of the property. So in the syndication world, uh, you know, pretty much every deal is a value add and, and many deals are, that are being purchased are in the 1970s or 1980s vintage. And for larger institutional investors, they typically are, they want 1990s or newer construction. And, you know, many of them will do 1980s. Many of them will even do 1970s, but it is a hurdle. Um, it's kind of like the property management thing. Some of them will be a strict no-go zone on anything older than 1990. And uh, so if you can help it, you know, focusing on the newer vintage um, product will definitely help you attract uh, institutional investors. But again, like everything else, it's, it's sometimes not a hard rule. Uh, and it's just, you have to, if you are going to dip below and, and purchase an older value add property, you have to make sure that the returns really speak for themselves and more than compensate for the perceived risk of the, uh, of the construction. So I'm going to talk about two types of uh, strategies and the commensurate return requirements for those strategies. So starting off with core plus, let me take a pause. I just saw a question come through. It's not letting me click. So Melissa, maybe you can help me out there. Yes, in the Q and A box, there's just it says, "How do you locate family offices?" Yeah, and I see how can we find institutional investors? What is the size of the property they'll invest? Yeah, absolutely. So I will answer this real quick, and then I'll try to leave time at the end to to answer everybody's questions. So institutional investors are all around us. They're it's 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 really amazing once you start looking for them how how many there are and and that they're everywhere. Um, so conferences, you have to go to the right conferences. So just as if you're in the syndication world, it feels like you jump on LinkedIn and everybody you know on LinkedIn is talking about the same thing. And when you go to a conference, you know, you're at a conference and everybody's talking about the same thing. It really is no different on the institutional side. If you know the right conferences to go to and, um, you know, the, the right places online, I suppose, to hang out, if you will, uh, you will find them. Um, and specifically, uh, the IMN uh, mi middle market multifamily uh, forums across the country are a pretty good place to start. So jumping into the, the different strategies. So core plus, which I'll define as lower risk, um, lower risk investments that are focused more so on the cash flow rather than the capital event or appreciation lends itself better to a longer term hold in a better location. And typically there might be some, some minor upside, but you're probably not projecting to raise revenue by anything more than 10%. So again, if you're not raising revenue more, by more than 10%, you're probably not taking much, you know, business plan execution risk or, or construction risk. So your return requirements are lower. Investors are typically seeking around a 13% net IRR for this strategy and an average 8% cash on cash over a five to seven year hold period. Um, and the IRR hurdle is less important 
for this strategy, because again, we're more focused on the yield of this strategy. So what investors want here is they want to get into a nice property. They typically want a newer property for core plus than they do for value add. So for them, they want a, you know, property in the two thousands that maybe is a little outdated. You can tighten up on management, raise rent slightly, maybe implement some sort of other income programs. And they want to know that they'll be clipping a coupon that'll build itself, you know, into year three and four and five to, to hopefully getting close to double digits. And, you know, with the use of interest only debt, you should be, have no problem going in at, you know, something of an eight plus percent uh, cash on cash. So this may not sound super challenging, but if you've ever underwritten a property that is in a true B, B plus location and was built in the 2000s or newer, you'll know that, you know, the cap rate is going to be somewhere around five or less. And, uh, you know, squeezing those sort of cash flows out of a deal like that can become challenging. So, so that's the core plus side on the value add returns. Now, this is a more of an opportunistic business plan looking for an opportunity to raise revenue, reduce expenses, improve management, lease up the property, you know, any of those strategies that are going to solve for a higher net IRR and the bulk of the returns are going to come from a capital event, either a refinance or a sale. Uh, you know, typically these types of value add investors, they want a sale. So they want their, they want you to, to get in and get out in two to four years. So, and, and that's an interesting distinction that I'll make is, uh, you know, maybe the sentiment has changed, maybe it hasn't, but for the last, I think three years in the syndication space, bridge loans have had a bad name and they've been in some circles, you know, a no, no. And it's almost the, I can't say it's the opposite for the institutional investors, but they are very wary of yield maintenance paper and they want to know that you can exit and hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, so on the, on, on the institutional side, bridge loans are fine. And you know, if it's not a bridge loan, they want to know that there's a clear path to exit in any case. So on the value add, 16% net IRR. And in order for it to really qualify as a value add deal, you've got to have some level of cash flow year one. And here I put 5% or more in year one. Um, some, some investors will accept less, but if you're going in with no cash flow in year one, I would categorize that as a deep value add opportunity or, or an opportunistic investment, which is going to have higher return hurdles you know, appropriately to adjust for that risk. If you're going in with, you know, a half vacant property, for example. So, so the value add returns are, you know, I, I would say you could even for a nicer asset could even get away with something less than a 16% net. Um, I I've even seen investors target a 16% gross IRR, which, you know, for, for an investor on a net basis, that would be something closer to a, maybe, you know, 13, but, um, you know, again, this is still looking for better quality asset, hopefully better location and newer vintage. And, uh, you know, they're underwriting these deals on a three to five year hold period. And then another thing is the equity multiple. So equity multiple may or may not be important to you or your investors at this time, but, uh, for institutional investors, especially for the uh, for the value add, they're looking for an equity multiple of 1.8 to two over a five to seven year hold period, depending on if it's, you know, a true value add or, or more so like a core plus investment. So definitely start paying attention to your equity multiples and look at your deal and, you know, really stack, stack it up and, and say, okay, well, you know, how close am I getting to a two X on a five year hold? And, and, you know, that's, if you're underwriting conservatively, that can absolutely be a challenge. Yeah. For some reason, it's not letting me click the Q and a box, but I see two, two Q and a's up there. So, um, you know, I apologize about that. If you want, I, I am able to see the, the chat box. Okay. So 
hopefully we can answer those questions, but I'll jump to uh, structures. So typical joint venture and co-GP structures. So my first bullet point here is you have to give up control. So this is a, a huge difference between a syndication and a joint venture with a sophisticated equity partner. Uh, the, the, they really want so in a syndication, you have all the, all the say, all the control. You create the PPM and the operating agreement, and then you hand it over to your investors and they sign it and that's it. And, you know, typically the language in that document is that you have all the control, et cetera. In a joint venture, it's a back and forth. It's all a negotiation. It starts with an LOI or a term sheet, and then it goes into negotiations of a legal agreement. And, uh, you know, this for me personally is a lot more fun and I like thinking through different structures and how to, you know, slice up the pie, grow it and, and make everybody happy. And, uh, but one of the big distinctions is in those legal agreements, they are going to have, you know, major investor decision rights and, uh, which, which relate to, you know, whether to sell or not whether to refi, you know, remove right to remove manager and different things like that. And, and one thing I always say is it doesn't matter what the legal documents say, whoever has the most money invested into a deal, they're the ones that has control. I'll take a quick question here in this current market. Do you think investors are willing to accept a lower preferred return in the context of joint ventures and institutional equity partners? Uh, definitely no. Uh, and here we're, we're right here talking about, um, you know, an eight to 10% preferred return. Uh, that That's pretty standard for the value add stuff. It's, you know, better and, and more standard to see something like a nine or a 10. And, you know, what's interesting is even on a core plus deal where you're only projecting to have, you know, seven or 8% cash on cash over the life of the investment, you know, you might still be in the deal within, you know, eight, nine, 10% preferred return. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't think that investors are going for a lower preferred return. So, so yeah, so hopefully I explained the control. It's just something that you have to get comfortable with. Uh, it's, you know, never really been an issue for us because we felt that we're partnering with somebody who's really smart, has a lot of experience and, our incentives are, are aligned and, and we're really going to be comfortable with their decisions. So going on to typical joint venture structure. So as I mentioned before, typical is a 90, 10 equity contribution where the equity partners putting in 90% of the equity and you're, you're responsible for 10% of GP equity. And this is really actually an interesting thing because looking at the syndication model, there is no, GP equity and there is no there's no tranche in the capital structure for the for the GP equity the the general partner will invest into the venture as an LP so they'll participate you know their capital will participate as an LP uh, which means hopefully on the same terms and it's not a bad way to go but what's what's interesting in a true joint venture is actually there is a joint a general partner capital account and a limited partner capital account so things can get more interesting and there can be uh, disparate priorities and returns uh, based on the structure um, for each capital account. So as I mentioned, we have an eight to 10% preferred return as pretty standard across core plus and value add opportunistic. You can even see a 12 and a unique nuance, uh, which I believe I discussed uh, on the last MFIN in terms of, you know, actually looking through my spreadsheet and, and waterfall and analyzing deal structures is the the IRR hurdle nature of the preferred return. So a lot of us know a preferred return as essentially working like investors are owed the first X percent of cash on cash. And then once that preferred return has been met, the remaining cash flows available for distribution are, are split at the promote rate. So, and in a more institutional joint venture structure, that is almost never the case. And what it, the way it works is it works like an IRR hurdle. So actually you're solving. So no matter how much cash flow you're producing, all of it goes to the investor. 
100%. And on, upon a sale or upon meeting the IRR hurdle, which would be a 100% of return of capital and a 8 or 10% preferred return on top of their 100% return of capital, then the promote would kick in. So as you can tell, you know, getting an investor all their money back would be really difficult without a sale. I mean, even in a refi scenario, that's very challenging. So the way that the IRR hurdle works is upon the sale, you know, so through the life of the investment, you've been kicking out cash flows to your LP. And then upon sale, you're going to run the, the investments cash flows through an X IRR um, calculation. And X IRR just is an XL um, formula which assigns dates to cash flows. And so it calculates your, your IRR calculation by the day. And, uh, and, and it's solving for a, the hurdle rate of eight or 10%. So that way the investor's return is cumulative and compounding, right? As you can imagine, if you can picture a waterfall or if you can't, which it probably can't cause they're pretty complicated, but, uh, please go ahead and go to my website, lonestarcapgroup.com at the top, download our underwriting model and you can see uh, an example waterfall. So in the waterfall, if I'm supposed to return, let's say 8% in year one, but I return zero, that 8% that I didn't return, let's say a million dollar investment, I owe them 80,000. That 80,000 that I owed them in year one is going to tack on to the capital account of the investor as if the investor now invested one million eighty thousand dollars into the project. So in year two, I'm going to owe them eight percent on one million eighty thousand. So it's a cumulative compounding measure calculated via X IRR. And once their eight percent IRR hurdle has been met, then as the general partner, I will receive my twenty percent promote. So that's just a an interesting clarification and example of how this promote structure works. And you might be wondering, well, how the heck are you going to get paid? <laughs> so uh, do larger deals and build an infrastructure that is large enough to, you know, earn enough fees off of your asset management fee, essentially, and your acquisition fee. And so speaking of fees, the standard uh, practice for you know, more sophisticated institutional joint ventures would be around a 1% acquisition fee and a 1% asset management fee. This can be tinkered and tweaked and is definitely uh, depending on deal size. So, and I, I just the other day spoke with a, an investment group that pays no acquisition fee and pays no asset management fee. And, you know, they will, they will pay a property management fee, thankfully. But, you know, so, so maybe you can squeeze a 4% property management fee out of them, pay your third-party management company 3% and then capture that 1% spread. But, you know, you can just take what you can get. So definitely, as you can see, compressed fee structure and certainly much more favorable preferred return and promote structure for the investor. Now, what's interesting is, as I explained, if you're the sponsor and based on the IR hurdle, you don't make any money until sale, what is your incentive? It is absolutely to sell. And for the institutional investor, they are okay with that. They want that because as I mentioned before, especially for the value add stuff, they want to get in and get out and they want to protect their capital and, you know, re-put it out, reinvest it. So for them, they're perfectly happy with you wanting to chase a sale, chase an IRR hurdle, because as we all know, you know, the time value of money, the quicker you can ex execute your business plan and then hit the sale, well, it'll have a higher IRR. And if you're, if you're against the IRR hurdle clock, you know, you want to meet their preferred return as quickly as possible. So you can now start monetizing your promote uh, and they're okay with it. And sometimes you'll see a minimum equity multiple in the deal, which is a pretty standard practice to really make it safe because, you know, you don't want to get into a deal. And then nine months later, you, you got a quick flip and you hit a 22 IRR, but the investor walks away with a, you know, 1.1 equity multiple or something like that. So moving on to, to co-GPs, co-general partnerships. So the way this works is a joint venture partner is going to partner with you really on the deal as, as a much bigger partner. And so it won't be a GP LP relationship. 
what will what it will look like is they will partner with you as a co-GP and they will either source an LP investor for the deal or they have their own means or their own, you know, balance sheet, et cetera, to, to bring in LP capital. Either way, basically co-GP partnerships result in your deal getting more funding. So whereas in a joint venture, you're still responsible for 10% of the equity and the JV partner will bring in 90%. In a co-GP, it could be a 95.5, it could be 99.1, it, it, it could be you know really small because they're really taking over the deal. In many cases, they're going to be the managing member of the joint venture entity and they're going to sign on the loan. Um, you know, There are groups that I have relationships with that get comfortable fronting pursuit costs, putting up the earnest money deposit. So if you have a nice deal under contract, but you don't have the $200,000 required to really secure the, secure the deal and put it under contract, you know, a co GP arrangement is a good way to go. And there are funds and groups that, that will actually put that $200,000 up for you. Joint ventures, not so much, you know, true limited partners, they don't like to take pursuit cost risk and it's not really in their mandate to sign on balance sheet, uh, to sign on loan carve outs. So it's really pushes you in that co-GP uh, partnership, which is certainly not a bad way to go, um, you know, as you're getting started and you're building up your own balance sheet and, and your own ability to, you know, uh, you know have uh, capital to put deals under contract. So in the co-GP partnership, you'll often see a slightly more favorable GP economics. So, so it, in total, the GP will get... Uh, you know, maybe a higher acquisition fee, uh, maybe a, a better promote instead of a 20% promote, maybe it's a 30% promote. Um, but those are going to be shared between you and your co GP. Um, and a promote is often split 50, 50 fees are maybe 75, 25, depending on the roles and who's doing what and, uh, you know, where the value is coming from. So that is a uh, kind of a rundown of the differences between joint ventures and co-GPs. Another thing I mentioned uh, in terms of the 90-10, a lot of LPs will do 80-20 on a first time deal. So it's just their rule that the first deal we're doing together, we can only do 80 and you're responsible for 20% of the equity. Then once we get comfortable with each other, we'll do a 90-10. So if, if that's a sticking point for you, you know, go out there and find the investors that will, will do the 90-10, will do the 95-5, um, and a lot of them say this is what they do. And in the end, they will get more comfortable if they see that, you, you know, you're early on and, and you are putting in, let's say a hundred thousand dollars of your own personal money into the deal. And that's almost all the money you have at the time to show for, they'll really appreciate that. And that will go a long way and, you know, will likely satisfy that requirement, um, if you can bring in additional capital from your end from let's say family and friends or, or, or via a syndication. So it's not uncommon to, in order to fulfill that 10 to 20% uh, GP equity piece to fulfill it with, you know, a, a 506 B syndication type of scenario. There's also um, GP funds. So there are, are companies that the only thing they, you know, the only thing, the only purpose of their fund is to, find uh, GP equity requirements and, and con contribute it. So it's, it's really fascinating how it all works because you'll go and get a 90-10 JV with your LP and then you'll go to your, your co-GP fund that'll put up 90% of your GP equity requirement and then all you're putting up is 10% of your uh, GP equity, which if you look on a global level in terms of uh, the 90-10 equity slice, uh, you're only putting in 1% of the equity and as you know, equity is levered. So, you know, your $100,000 piece of equity would be, you know, a, I don't know, $10 million deal or more. Other deal structures. So as I mentioned before, things can get more creative uh, with more sophisticated parties and with a capital account for the GP and a capital account for the LP. And what I mean by that is you can do things like senior subordinate structures where 
the L, so the LP's capital is going to be in a preferred position over the GP equity. So you're actually putting your capital at risk first. And once the LP has received a certain rate of return or something like that, uh, then your capital can maybe catch up. So they get a 6% first, then you get 6%, then your pari pursued to a 12. Um, you know, there's really a million different ways that you can slice it up, which uh, you know, really gets my juices flowing. Uh, preferred equity is something that you're going to start running into a lot. Once you start trying to go out there and network and, and meet these institutional equity partners, you're going to see that many of them are real estate finance companies and they have a full spectrum of programs that they offer uh, to really fill the need of, of any borrower or sponsor. And the reason why I said borrower is because they often have debt facilities involved in their programs. So they'll range from providing senior bridge debt to mezzanine loans, um, preferred, you know, non-participating preferred equity uh, and, and participating preferred equity. And then finally joint venture equity, which is what we were talking about previously. So a lot of groups that you're going to go to for joint venture equity are going to say, yeah, we're a pass on the, on the joint venture, but we would love to offer you a, a preferred equity term sheet. And the reason why they're willing to do this is because they know they're coming into the deal in a secured position, you know, in a more secured position in the capital structure and with, with still very favorable economics. So I don't really recommend pursuing preferred equity unless you have extremely high conviction about the project, which is rare to find these days just because where return requirements are. So just to give you an example, the most uh, really simple example of preferred equity would be um, they'll put up, let's say 85% of the equity and you'll be responsible for 15% of the equity, but the, the 85% of the equity is senior. Their return is senior uh, to anything that your 15% is going to get. So th that already is going to make it harder for you to raise that 15% equity because that equity is coming in in a levered subordinate position. But the preferred equity, let's say, is going to receive 6% cash on cash first, and then they'll also receive a 6% accrual. Or another way, and, and to explain accrual is, for every year, they're owed 6% on their money in current yield, but also for every year of ownership, they are owed 6% upon a capital event. So when you refinance or sell, or sell you'll owe them another 6%. So essentially they're solving for a 12% return. Another way that they can structure this is through a, through a sweep where it'll be something like, uh, you know, they want to receive uh, 10% cash flow, and the first 6% will go towards paying their, their current yield requirement. And then the latter four will go towards paying down their capital account. And the way, the way they want this to work is they want their preferred equity position to amortize down through the life of the investments so that their, their last dollar of exposure in the capital structure is you know, to a point that when they're anticipating a, a refi or a sale five, seven years down the road, um, you know, there's just higher likelihood that they'll be able to exit and meet their returns. So again, in terms of preferred equity, you're going to start seeing it a lot because they're much more willing to put it out. It's not a loan, but it's not a partner that is fully standing shoulder to shoulder with you in the deal, experiencing the ups and downs, you know, almost equally. Um, so again, preferred equity really for projects that you have a lot of conviction on. And what that, what I mean by that specifically is if you're going to take on preferred equity, which typically costs anywhere from, depending on how much of the, if you're only going to do 50% of the equity as preferred, it could get as cheap as, you know, 9%. If you're going to do 90% of the equity, which is, you know, really the, the, the highest they'll go, um, you know, it could cost somewhere in the mid teens. So if you call it 14, 15%, I mean, that, that is common equity returns. So you need to have a deal that has 20% returns in order to make sense to lever, up, lever it up with, with a 15% slice of preferred equity, right? Otherwise, if your prospective returns for a deal on a project basis is 15% and you're going to lever it up with 15% money, it's, it's not accretive to your transaction. It's, it's just going to increase the risk and, and not magnify returns. So 
this last piece is make it happen. So uh, I'm starting to see more questions come in. Unfortunately, I'm still not able to click the Q and A box, but attend the networking events, make introductions, study the market, find out who's doing deals with who, you know, really pay attention to the partnerships that are happening and um, who's funding, whose deals and have those conversations and, and re really, you know, study the market and get to know the players, especially for your market. Um, you know, if you pick that market that you want to be in, there are investors that also want to be in that market. And it's, you know, far more likely that you'll get a deal done with them than a deal than, than a group that's more focused either broadly or in other markets. So this next point is always have a deal to share. So when having introduction uh, phone calls or meetings with uh, capital providers, it, you know, people don't like to have abstract conversations. You can, and you should certainly do have them and ask the right questions broadly about what markets are you guys interested in? What are your return requirements? What are you seeing in the market? What type of, you know, strategy? What do you, what, you know, what do you typically do for, for fees, um, promote, you know, ask all the right questions and, and really find out, are they a partner that makes sense for you to work with? But then at the end, always have a deal to share. Always follow up, always have a deal in the works um, that you can actually dig in and, and start having a discussion with. And, you know, the next point, which should be obvious, but focus on deals that make you excited and preferably under contract. So it's obviously hard to always have a deal under contract that is available for a partner to take a look at. So it's certainly not a requirement. Some people may think, oh, well, I've got to get the deal under contract first and then share it with investors. Uh, it's definitely not the case. But when I say focus on deals that make you excited, you know, uh, this is a, some advice that I heard from, from a fund in Florida that has, uh, you know, $400 million of equity. And, and he was saying that, you know, one of the biggest things is he just, he wants to see, you know, the operating partner excited about the deal and not just look at it as, you know, another transaction and, you know, just a way to earn a fee and move on. So deals that make you excited and, Certainly, if it's under contract, they will be much more willing to take a good hard look at it because they know it's, you know, fully baked and that, that there's a real opportunity. It, it is frustrating for everybody involved when you're digging into a deal and then you, you lose out in the bidding process or, or what have you. This next point, know your deal cold, defend your numbers. So, you know, the conversations around a deal uh, with, with these partners is very involved, super in depth, late nights, and you need to really know your numbers and you need to be able to defend them because it's your job to present the most aggressive, um, you know, set of the numbers because it's their job to knock them down. So this is not your time to say, I'm a conservative investor and our conservative underwriter and all this stuff because they're going to look at your numbers and assume you're aggressive and they're going to assume that's the baseline, which they're going to work backwards from. So you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. You need to be excited, be aggressive, you know, really put the deal in the best light and defend it, you know, have the data to back it up. The co-star, the Yardie, the market research, you've called the comps, you've, you know, you, you've, you've been there and, and all of that stuff. So they want to see, you, you know, they're looking, for you to defend yourself. And uh, it reminds me of a phone call that I had where, you know, they were doing their standard, you know, your exit cap rate is too low. And, um, you know, which they'll, they'll say it without even thinking. And it's just the standard thing because they're just assuming, oh, the exit cap rate is too low. I'm going to bump it up and, and make myself feel better. And I, I said, no, actually, I made a mistake. My, my exit cap rate is, is too conservative. I, I think we should actually lower it by 25 basis points and here's why and here are the comps to support it and they said oh actually yeah we checked it out you're right we can we can actually go with a lower cap rate be prepared for many no's this is obvious for anything so i shouldn't even have to say it but uh i will it, it like anything a lot of rejection a lot of no's and uh you know be prepared for that and and but it's a great a, a no is a fantastic thing because you're you're really building a relationship. Every time that you sit down and, and go over a deal that ends up being in a pass, it's just one step closer to being a yes. And, and a yes is a really big moment for you. You know, it's not, it's not a yes, I'll invest 50,000 into your project. It's, it's yes, 
my company and I, my investment committee is opening up the doors to our hundred, 200, 500 billion dollars of equity. And when we say yes and want to do one deal with you, that means we want to do 10 deals with you. So it's worth it. You know, especially if you want to scale and do this long term, it's absolutely worth it. Be prepared for many no's. Um, and lastly, retail investors are still very important. So if you know that this is the path you want to go down, you want to structure big joint ventures and uh, you still should focus on building relationships and, and raising capital and working with the smaller retail investors. There's, as you can tell from the different structures that we discussed and different ways that deals come together, there's always going to be ways to fit your you know, family and friends type of investors into your deals. And, uh, you know, they can be extremely valuable when, when there's gaps and things like that. So let me take a look at the chat. Can you explain more detail what the equity multiple is? Yeah, that is my fault. So jumping over here really quickly, the equity multiple is simply your, money over money return and it's irrespective of time. So if I double my money in any amount of time, it's a two point, it's a two X equity multiple. So the reason why you always have to specify, you know, time with equity multiple because it's, it doesn't take into account time. So that's why I say here, uh, a two X over five to seven year hold period. Hopefully that makes sense. So, uh, I, I see five Q and A's. Melissa, can you help us out with the Q and A? Yes. Um, let's see. You just seem to know. Um, uh, you may have answered because some people. They went to the chat. Yeah. I don't know if you answered. How do you locate family offices? That was the first one. Um, can you do a brief rundown of promote? I'm not sure. Sure. Yeah. So let me do that really quickly. So, so promote is a performance-based compensation, usually subordinate to a preferred return. So as we talked before, a preferred return is the priority level of return that an investor gets before the promote kicks in. And so basically without putting any money in the deal, the general partner is entitled to a certain amount of the profits after the investor has received their preferred return. In a 20% promote scenario where you sold the property, there's a million dollars worth of profit after the investor has gotten all their money back and received their preferred return. Now you're able to split that million dollars worth of profit 80, 20. So 20% 20 of that would go to the sponsor. Um, and then the last person's just asking um, if they can get a hold of your presentation and maybe how to reach out and contact you, but it looks like yours, um, the, Rob's email's on the screen, so use that. Um, and I'm sure he's more than happy to send over his presentation. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll do now after this, I'll take this presentation and I'll put it in the underwriting model Dropbox that you'll be able to um, receive via email when you sign up for the newsletter on LoneStarCapGroup.com. So yeah, I'll be sure to put this presentation in there. Feel free to check us out more at LoneStarCapGroup.com. Also, um, you know, my advisory business in terms of uh, debt and equity advisory, um, Green Oaks Capital. And if you want to reach out to me directly, there's my email. Happy to, you know, discuss anything further or jump on a phone call. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. That was um, very informative. Great session. Um, and um, let's see. All right, so we will, we're going to head into a short break. Let me do this. Yep, we're going to head into a short break. Um, I did want to mention before we go to break, we have just another minute or so. Um, so in room, so we are at, so we'll come back at 345. So in room one, we'll have a panel of state of the mid 2020 multifamily market. And then in room two here with here in room two, we will have um, Tom Lawn with and he will be discussing discover the best place to stash cash and make it bulletproof. Um, but before we go, I wanted to mention um, we have a nonprofit that we are trying to to raise funds for um, during the summit this this time around. So I wanted to put these two links into the chat box for all the attendees. Please go check it out. 
we actually just got word that um, all donations are going to be matched up to five thousand dollars so um, go check it out it, it supports um, it the foundation supports Christian um, small to mid-sized Christian um, schools so um, go check that out it supports um, scholarships, funding, um, paying teachers, all sorts of things that go along with running a private Christian school. So um, we really appreciate your donation. And like I said, um, all donations will be matched up to $5,000. So it's a really great opportunity. And that's only during the summit. So please take a minute, go check that out. Um, we hope you'll um, give to that good um, foundation. All right, so we, like I said, we will see you back here at 345 and with, with Tom Lawn here in room two.